When a young woman vanishes in the middle of the night from a care facility in a small town, her disabilities become a focal point of the case and a father's worst nightmare begins. The investigation into this seriously mysterious disappearance seems like it may have hit a wall, but there is always hope that if the right person hears this story and is brave enough to make a phone call, Rosemary Temperley might be reunited with her family once again. I originally looked into this case seven years ago on my show Searchlight and was soon contacted by her father. He asked that I try to keep Rosemary's story out there. So today, we are highlighting the still unsolved 2016 disappearance of Rosemary Temperley and sharing all the latest information that we can find on this case. Located at the heart of what is known as Oklahoma's Green Country, Oak Mulgee is the county seat of Oak Mulgee County. 38 miles south of Tulsa, the city gets its name from the Muscogee word Okimulgee, which means boiling waters. This name was bestowed upon the area due to its numerous nearby rivers and hot springs. Oklahoma has a surprisingly lengthy history when it comes to the mental health of its residents. The Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services was first established by the state government in 1953, although mental health services in the area date all the way back to 1873, when the Cherokee Nation first established a care facility for Native Americans living with mental illnesses. Since then, many more facilities have opened up in the area with varying degrees of success. Rosemary Temperley was 20 years old with short brown hair and brown eyes, standing at just 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighing around 125 pounds. She wore prescription eyeglasses with thick black frames and walked with a somewhat noticeable limp. Although she could legally be considered an adult, it's been reported that she had the approximate mental capacity of a 13-year-old. Some sources report that she was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which generally has less severe symptoms than classic autism, according to the Autism Society. However, others report that she was generally autistic. In our conversations with her father, he also mentioned that she may have been dealing with schizophrenia. This is why she was staying in what has been described as a care facility or a group home in Oak Mulgee, where she was supposed to be monitored regularly by licensed professionals. There isn't a lot of information surrounding the care that Rose Marie, who was commonly called Rose by her friends, was receiving in this facility. But what we do know is that the place she was living in was designed for people who are developmentally disabled to help them obtain a sense of independence along with receiving the care that they need. The facility is run by an Oklahoma-based organization called Central State Community Services, and on their website, they claim to provide community-based services for people of all ages with intellectual and or developmental disabilities. From their website's About section, it would seem that these services have been pretty successful since the organization was first proposed back in 1989. According to Rose's friend, Stacy Shankel, Rose was always an outgoing, friendly girl who it would seem never knew a stranger. Indeed, many accounts paint Rose as a smiling beacon of light, somebody who weathered hardships by storing positivity in reserves. She was known to literally put on a show when times were tough, often donning colorful wigs and makeup and adopting various stage names like Candy, Shannon, Sasha, or Amy. Three of these four names were actually the names of various maternal figures that Rose had throughout her life, but no one knows exactly where the name Candy came from. In early 2016, a distinct change was noticed in Rose's attitude, turning her from the bright, bubbly woman that everyone knew to someone who could go from a nearly catatonic state to an emotional outburst in moments. She began experiencing severe schizophrenic episodes where she would speak to people who just were not there. It's unclear if a recent medication change played some part in this reaction. However, the young woman who normally spent her time laughing and making other people smile, who was known for singing along to songs while playing her acoustic guitar, she seemed to be a shadow of her former self. Stacy Shankel recalled the last time that she saw Rose, the day before her disappearance, and remarked that although Rose normally had a hug and kind words to say to her, on this day, quote, it was as if she didn't even recognize me. 
Rose's father, John Temperley, describes his daughter as somebody who was always eager to make people happy and trusting to a fault. According to him, he backs up Stacy's statement saying that a stranger was a friend that Rose just hadn't met yet. However, John was also deeply concerned about his daughter, and this concern was amplified during the last phone conversation that he had with her just a few days before she disappeared. According to him, Rose was in an obvious state of distress and was, in his words, freaking out, stating, Daddy, you're not my father. They're coming for me. They're coming to get me. If you were my father, you would believe me. Obviously, this isn't the sort of thing that any father wants to hear from his child, and it begs the question, who exactly was coming for Rose? Was this statement part of a delusion, or was it based in reality? The answer seems to be most likely the latter. As due to Rose's schizophrenic state, her doctor had decided to transfer her to a hospital facility where she could receive the care that was required. Rose was aware of this, and she had made it abundantly clear in the past that she absolutely hated hospitals. It seemed like there really was no other option, though, as her current living situation was just not designed for residents experiencing delusional episodes. And her doctor believed that this was the best place for her until the schizophrenic symptoms could be controlled. Rose was due to be transferred to this hospital on February 3rd, 2016. But unfortunately, she never made it there. Around 10 p.m. on the evening of February 1st, Rose went to bed for the night. According to staff, however, she continued to wake up throughout the evening and well into the morning of February 2nd, waking about every 45 minutes to an hour until around 2.30 a.m. At about 4 a.m., when a staff member was making their usual morning rounds and checking on the residents, they discovered that Rose's door was locked. After a few attempts to awaken Rose by knocking, the staff member grew worried and managed to get into the bathroom that was shared by Rose and another resident. When they opened the door to Rose's room, they discovered that she wasn't there and her window was open. Looking outside of the window, the staff members saw that there were clothes and other things strewn across the yard. Upon closer inspection, it was determined that these things were in fact Rose's belongings. Among these items were Rose's purse and the acoustic guitar that she loved to play. The staff member immediately called the police. When Rose's father, John, first learned that she was missing at around 6 a.m. on February 2nd, he initially wasn't too concerned. Although Rose hadn't yet run away from this particular home, in the past, she had been known to run away from foster homes that she had been typically unhappy in. Rose would return usually within a few hours. Because of this pattern, John didn't immediately jump into searching for Rose, although he did remain in constant contact with law enforcement to see what he could do about Rose's disappearance. When those hours became days, it was apparent that this was not like the previous times that Rose had taken off. When John spoke with the Oak Mulkey County Sheriff's Office about this, he was told that because of Rose's age, being legally an adult, that she could go missing if she chose to. A search and rescue team known as Bridging the Gap was called in to join the search for Rose. According to an article about Rose on the Missing Persons of America website, the staff of the facility was very helpful and allowed the entire property to be searched, including beneath the home itself. Drones were flown all around the area, with the people operating them desperate to catch a glimpse of anything leading to Rose. They even printed flyers and distributed them around the Elk Mulgee area and to local businesses. For quite a while, community members helped search, but to no avail. It was as though Rose Marie had simply vanished into thin air. Despite independent search and rescue efforts, an anonymous source informed Missing Persons of America that they felt as though the Oak Mulgee County Sheriff's Office doesn't seem to care about Rose's disappearance, stating that they and others have had to pretty much beg to get them to investigate any tips or leads that had been reported. After hearing this, the writer for the Missing Persons of America article, Carla Venata, attempted to give an officer a tip that she had received about Rose and was simply told that about 50 to 60 other people had called in with similar information and that she could email the tip in, which she promptly did. As she put it, quote, 
it was easy to get a sense of why others felt that they were not doing enough on Rose's case. Despite these feelings of doubt that some may have had regarding Oak Mulkey's law enforcement, Rose's case is still an open investigation with their sheriff's department, and they've even called the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation to assist. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NECMEC, has also remarked that they have had a case open on Rose for from almost the very beginning. Her case has also been entered into NamUs, and dental records and DNA have been logged into the system. So, is it really fair to say that law enforcement isn't doing enough? Or are they simply doing what they can do with the resources that they have available? In February of 2017, just a year after Rose's disappearance, there was possibly a disheartening break in the case. The body of a young woman was found in a dumpster outside of a gas station in Oak Mulgee. Thinking that it could be Rose, her father, John Timperley, got into his car and he drove to the press conference about that discovery. He said in an interview with KTUL News, it's an ongoing investigation. As far as I know, I hope on one end that it's not my daughter, but on the other end, I'd just like to have that knowledge to know that the wait is over. The hardest part is not knowing whether she's alive, whether she's dead, how she's being treated. Eventually, it was determined that the remains were not Rose, but they belonged to a woman that had gone missing out of Colorado in early 2017. A suspect was quickly arrested in that case, but the question of what happened to Rose lingered in the aftermath. Time is not my friend in this, John Timberley told reporters in another interview. I have to play games with my mind in order to get out of bed. She's on vacation. It's just going to be a little bit longer. She'll be back. Truly, his pain is something that few can fathom, and no one should ever have to handle that. To this day, when asked about Rose, his response has been, I'm lost. The question still remains. What happened to Rosemary Temperley on that early February morning? Though there are still no answers as of us retouching this case seven years after the fact now, there are a few theories making the rounds through media outlets and other sources. One of those most notable theories being the possibility that Rose might have been groomed and she could have even been sold into human trafficking. A few days before her disappearance, a staff member at the care facility witnessed Rose talking to someone on the phone. When they asked Rose who she was talking to, she responded, My uncle Charles, there's been a funeral in the family and he's coming to get me. John Timperley told Missing Persons of America that there is nobody named Charles or Charlie on either side of Rose's family that he knows of. Could this Charlie be the result of one of Rose's delusions? If not, and if he did exist, was he somebody who could have been trying to lure Rose into a false sense of security so that he could abduct her? Either of these possibilities seems likely, but no comment has been made by investigators regarding if they've been able to access the care facility's phone records or whether they have had any success in tracking down who Rose may have been talking to on that day. Oak Mulkey County Sheriff's Office Sergeant Aaron Swayze theorized to KFOR News on the three-year anniversary of Rose's disappearance, quote, she could have met someone that convinced her to run off with them, and she went at first willingly, but she could be traded on the streets for sex, for drugs. While this certainly isn't an outcome that anybody wants to be true, it would at least indicate that Rose could possibly be alive out there, somewhere, waiting to be found. Given the fact that Rose was, according to some, trusting to the point of being easily manipulated, this theory seems plausible. If that's the case, there may be somebody out there who's hiding Rose, or somebody who has seen her and not connected her to a missing persons investigation. In any case, with the amount of time that has passed since her disappearance, it's important to keep her name and face out there. There is also the possibility that Rose could have left on her own accord, possibly in a schizophrenic state, which could explain why her belongings were strewn haphazardly across the yard from where she was staying. Regarding that possibility, John Timperley said, Rose, if you just don't want to come back, fine, just let us know. It's abundantly clear that Rose Marie has many people out there who care about her, 
people who she lit up with her smile, her charm, her vibrancy, and love for things like music and acting. It has now been eight long years since Rose vanished. Over 3,000 days of many people, including her father, being left with an ache in their heart and a void that can only be filled by Rosemary's return. Rosemary Temperley is five feet, five inches tall and weighs around 125 pounds with brown eyes and short brown hair, although she's been known to dye her hair and wear wigs. She walks with a limp, wears prescription glasses, and maybe using an alias. She was last seen wearing a gray t-shirt, pink Tweety Bird pajama pants, tall brown cowboy boots, and a black jacket. She is without necessary medications and might not be entirely cognizant. She's considered to be an endangered missing person. If you have any information at all regarding the disappearance of Rosemary Temperley, please contact the Okmulgee County Sheriff's Office at 918-756-4311. Her father created a Facebook page called Let's Find Rose. But over the years, the updates have waned, one of the latest being from about six months ago, a link to the Eric Clapton song, Tears in Heaven a sign that John might be trying to process the worst possible outcome. He deserves to know where his daughter is. He deserves to know the truth. If you're enjoying this show, please check out Seriously Mysterious, the podcast. We have over 150 episodes waiting for you.